So good morning and welcome to another episode of Better Business, Better Life. Today, I am joined by Jack Martin, who is coming to us from Scottsdale in Arizona. Is that right, Scott? That's correct. Sorry? That's (laughs) correct. Excellent. Um, and Jack is the uh, is it, would it be a co-founder of the company Fifty Two Ten. Yep, my business partner Nate Petty and myself co-founded this business about uh, six years ago. Okay, great. And we're going to hear a little bit more about this business. We've had a quick chat before we came online and there's some really interesting stuff behind this business. But before we do that, I would love for you to start with your professional and personal best that you can share with the audience. So I'll tell you a story. Um, the, uh, it'll kind of be the story of two different businesses. So when I started um, in investment real estate and working for a different company, and my existing business partner today was also working with that company. So that company had grown. It was more of a family business, and it had grown to about 20 employees. And it started to become what most businesses come, which is kind of organized chaos. <laughs> yeah. And so luckily, um, somebody who was uh, a friend of the, the family, a business owner, uh, gave him the book Traction. So Gino Wickman's book Traction, which outlines the whole EOS uh, philosophy. So he had, had, had heard that if you, everybody reads this book and you guys implement this, you guys will double your business. So that was music to his ears. So gave us all the book. We all read the book. I fell in love with it. My existing business partner fell in love with it as well really push that business to implement right away. And this is the architecture that we need. But what we quickly discovered, just to kind of um, summarize this, is that EOS is not for everyone. So who it's not for is people who don't like accountability. So you you know about that. I do, yeah. (laughs) Really, really important that you, even if you've never had to be accountable, that you embrace the idea of being accountable Um, so that it's not for that. And it's also not for people who, um, aren't interested in replacing people in this case, family. Um, if, um, if they're wrong person, wrong seat. Mm. So even moving them from the wrong seat to the right seat. So if there's that kind of stubborn heels dug in attitude that, you know, we're not getting rid of anybody, we're just going to keep everybody in the same role and they're wrong people, wrong seat. It's just not a fit. So that was kind of the trigger for, for me to exit. And when I did, my existing business partner exited right behind me and we went and started 5210. Mm. So 5210, we began with uh, EOS as the architecture. So we self-implemented for about three years, but we started from the very beginning of the business when it was in design phase um, with traction. We were having level 10s every week and we didn't even have any business yet. So without question, I would give a a large portion of the the, business. credit for the success that we've had to to having used uh, EOS as the architecture for our business. Mm -hmm. So then, of course, at about year three, we started to get, you know, we grew to about 20 employees ourselves and we wanted another set of eyes. And that's where Scott Rusnak came on board as our implementer and um, the rest is history. So and Scott is an amazing guy. So we're, we're very good friends and he keeps me on track as well as well as being a, a peer EOS implementer. So, yeah. So 5210, what is it? And why so is it called that? <laughs> yeah. So this is interesting that when you start a business, you should be setting your 10-year goals. So Nate and I um, wanted to buy 52 manufactured housing communities in 10 years. So we were that was our 10-year goal. So Because we were so focused or hyper focused on that, we decided to name the business after it. Very nice. So that's where it came from. Beautiful. So that's your your professional kind of story. What about your personal best? I got something really neat to share with you. So uh, I got seven children. And and I've heard it said that um, each child that you have will teach you more on the personal development front than you could ever get from any seminar or book. And then the more kids you have, the better person you'll likely end up being if you listen to them, right? Mm -hmm. So I got a chance to be a good person with seven kids, right? But the oldest of my children taught me something that's probably one of the most profound personal um, success stories. And that's how to let go. So she was a teenager. She was going down a path that dad thought was the wrong path. And I was trying to control every aspect of her life. And it ended up manifesting in probably the most toxic relationship that you could imagine between a father and a child. And that's certainly not, not something that either of us wanted. At some point I let go 
or at least it got bad enough to where I was required to let go. And that um, experience of letting go has led to the opposite of that. So amazing relationship where she calls me about everything and shares all of her, her challenges or all of her difficulties. And many times she doesn't need any advice. She just needs a sounding board, mm -hmm. but it has been amazing, a, a reversal of, and what a, what a great success story, but that, that experience of letting go as a, as a father has also taught me to let go at work yes. and also taught me to let go in life. Yeah. And that really to trust that there's a, there's a greater power at work in your life and you don't need to be gripping the wheel so doggone tight. Yeah. And that's what trust, Gino talks about in his book, right? It's right. like, as soon as we can actually learn to let go, then the amazing things start to happen. That's right. That's right. Mm. So, yeah, I would say that's the, that's, it's a personal victory, but it manifests everywhere. Oh, fantastic. So in your current business, what role do you play? I'm the, I'm the sales guy. So I, I, I do all the investor relationships. So I build relationships with investors and then I make sure that they have the best experience that they could possibly have. Mm -hmm. I, um, I'm the visionary. So I do kind of business development. Um, I, I, you know, look at, look for, kind of far forward into the future to say, Hey, where can, where, where can we be adding new things or at least exploring new things that are going to be necessary two, three years from now? Mm -hmm. I also build relationships with owners of properties that are not for sale. So at some point when, um, you know, that decision cycle occurs in their life that, you know, we're, we're already at the table and we already have a relationship there. And then I, I have a hand in the overall brand or the overall kind of um, outward facing brand of the company. Yeah. Okay. So a typical kind of visionary role in a business. Yeah, I'm not yeah. the X's and O's guy. So I understand <laughs> the X's and O's, but you yeah. wouldn't want me being the quarterback. <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah. And um, before you came across EOS, I mean, were you even aware of this, this visionary type role that companies need in order to grow? Is it something that you had heard no, of? I mean, or? To it. So like when, that, when I read that book for the first time, and this yeah. goes back, shoot, that's probably 10 years ago already. Um, but when I first read that book, that it was just light bulbs going off chapter after chapter. And it's unbelievable. I can't believe we've never come across something like this. And almost to the degree where I wouldn't start a business or even recommend anybody start a business unless they had an architecture mm -hmm. like this. It's kind of like the blueprint mm -hmm. of how to build a successful business. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't really matter what the business is. So yeah, I did not have an awareness of it. I was just plugging away, doing my role at the, at the place of business I was at. Yeah. It's just interesting for me. I notice that sometimes when I work with clients, you know, the fact that they suddenly have this permission to take on board this role, it, just, it is a light bulb, but it's also just a sense of relief. It's like, oh, thank goodness, there's nothing wrong with me. This is perfectly normal. <laughs> yeah. Well, my yeah. business partner and I, you know, we share that role to some degree. Okay. So we have monthly visionary meetings. I have one tomorrow morning. Yep. Where just the two of us get together. And it's, it's really about forward thinking vision. You know, where are there, um, you know, we like to think of it in terms of where is there a rock in our shoe yep. that we just keep walking along and just kind of ignoring and hoping it'll go away because it never will. Mm -hmm. And, um, and how can we solve for those? And that doesn't, that, that allows us to not clog up our weekly, uh, level 10 meetings with our, our staff. Yeah, oh, that's a good idea. Okay. So how many do you have on your team now? Our, our leadership staff is five of us. Yep. And then there's about 20 employees outside of that. Mm -hmm. And we have quite a few um, contract um, relationships as well yep. that aren't employees, but they, they work with us regularly. They really know our, uh, our company and our brand. Mm. And so you said that you self-implemented for the first sort of three years, which makes a lot of sense when you're starting out, you know, um, to put that framework in place. And then you started working with Scott. Tell me a little bit about how things change once you started working with Scott. The first thing that was noticeable was we got to participate in our quarterly planning sessions instead of running them. Yeah. And I don't think you, you really appreciate the difference unless you've experienced both. Mm -hmm. So it was, it was just an absolute breath of fresh air. It's easier to brainstorm. You come with more of a creative, um, um, you just get a different lens, a different set of goggles when you show up at a, at a quarterly or an annual when you're a participant versus running it. So I think that stands out the most, but then there's another piece of it too. So Scott, 
know, he really pushes us. So, you know, he knows what my weakness is, my one thing. He knows what Nate's is, and he's constantly challenging us to, Jack, you got to step step away from that. You got to let go of the vine. You have to do this. So, so it, you know, having somebody there that's that you're you're hiring them and you're you're leaning on their experience. Mm-hmm. He's seen countless uh, co-founders or, or company owners like myself that have gone through the same struggle. So he he understands what it takes to to guide you through that. So that I think those things stand out. Yeah. And do you have a favorite EOS tool that you uh, think has really changed the business significantly or that, you know, that was had the most impact? Well, for a guy like me, um, who's, who tends to be more, more um, feelings and, and, you know, ambition and, and, and just gumption and less X's and O's, um, (laughs) the everybody having a number was probably the thing that stands out. So creating six uh, consistent uh, measurable results um, is something that, you know, previous business experiences I've had or previous employment roles I've had, you just show up and do your job, but you weren't reporting on a specific number. So I I also could give some credit to, um, you know, how we've achieved some of the success we've achieved on at, at least in, in the portion of the business that I'm responsible for having that accountability to hit those numbers. Yeah. So, yeah. And being um, okay with the idea that when I fall short, that I'm probably going to get poked a little bit at my L2 yes. and it's okay. So yeah, I think that probably stands out for me. And that's the accountability component, isn't it? That people sometimes struggle with, but it's actually, it can be really enlightening. I mean, we had, we've just gone through lockdown for quite a long period of time over here in New Zealand. And throughout that time, businesses were affected in, in quite major ways. And so you think looking at the numbers can actually be quite scary because the numbers suddenly change, you know, they're, they're not, not the greens that you're expecting all the time. However, the focus on it, the fact that you're looking at it all the time, when you're getting those reds, you're going, we can't continue like this. We need to do something different. How do we actually do something different Mm -hmm. to make sure that we survive and I think it's been really enlightening for a lot of businesses to actually have that clarity around what they need and therefore being able to see when things need to change would that be fair yeah it's safe for you yeah it kind of um um I've heard it said what gets measured gets improved Mm, yeah it's that kind of idea yeah so yeah absolutely agree Okay. And so in terms of, you know, having a measurable for everybody in the organization, is it every single person? Like, could I call up anybody in your firm right now and say, Hey, what's your measurable? And they've all got a number that they're working to. Oh yeah. Some of yeah. us have more than one, yeah, so I have several. Yeah. but even, even down at the property level. So we've done something quite unique. So we run our business with EOS, but we also run every single park with EOS. Oh. So every park has quarterly goals, every, um, these are manufactured housing communities, also known as mobile home parks. Yep. So we call them parks. Um, every park has its own uh, management staff and its own uh, maintenance staff, and they all have their own numbers. So it really comes down to if you will do these things every week, no matter what, we'll be successful, period. There's a lot of other things they do as well, but those are the key metrics that if those get measured, then then those things improve. Yeah. So, does that mean so with our vision traction organizer we've got the top vision part component and the traction part so the vision part stays the same across all of those parts but it's the traction part that actually changes in terms of what they're looking to achieve in the year in the quarter yeah not really because each one of these parks is different so some of the parks have a different vision too so okay. all of them like we're we're purchasing our business really focuses on acquiring underperforming properties yeah so they're owned by a mom and pop they're not professionally managed they're just there's some, in some way they're broken, right? Mm -hmm. So usually that means there's vacant spaces or um, there's homes that need to be renovated and sold, or there's maintenance that needs to be done, or there's all, all measure of things, but every park will show up in kind of a different um, uh, condition. Some are more of an operational, excuse me, an operational uh, turnaround and some are more physical. So the 10 year vision for the park is different for each one of those. So they're very uniquely built, almost like each one of them is their own separate business. Yeah. And we run, we run them that way. Okay. So yeah, it's just, they all get annual goals every year for the park and they get quarterly goals for, you know, or rocks that we focus on. And um, 
And then there's level tens with uh, every week with every management team and every, every, every park. So it's almost like we're running a bunch of little, little mini businesses within our overall business. Love so it's it. really neat, really neat. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, so you said that when you first started, there was just the two of you and you were running your level 10 meetings with the two of you. Again, some people kind of go, well, what's the point of that? There's only two of us, but tell me how that worked for you and what it did for you in terms of meeting structure. Well, I, first of all, it, it developed a great habit. So we got used to it from the right out of the uh, out of the gate. We do L tens every week on Wednesday at a specific time, and it's always the same time, same same format. Everything's the same. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, but I think that the piece that helped us build the business was the IDS. So as you're working through, you know, the architecture of of certain things, you know, in our business we have. Um, an investment side of the business. We have the property management side of the business. And then you have the business of the business, right? Which is kind of central to all of that. But there's issues that, it, that come up um, as the business grows on all of those fronts. So even when we're architecting, you know, how are we going to manage investor reporting, for example? Hmm. So you come up against some roadblock where this is just going to turn into an administrative snowball. How are we going to design this, you know, looking forward so that when we get to this many parks that we, or this many investors that we don't have these issues and they slow us down. Right. So I think that the IDS was probably, and it still is um, one of the most, it's just the, the best part of the whole week. You get to solve stuff. That's, that's uh, another one of those pebbles in your shoe. You get to solve yeah. those. Yeah. It's interesting, isn't it? Because when you first start talking about issues, people see it as being a bit of a negative, but in actual fact, so such a great tool to bring up because they're not just issues, they're opportunities. They're just things that can, um, you know, stopping you from getting to where you want to get to. Right. That's yeah. right. And and if you just ignore them, they're not going to go away. <laughs> yeah. The pebble's still going to be in your shoe. It's not going away. Yeah. yeah. So that's interesting. What's been the biggest challenge or the biggest issue that you've faced in the business so far? Because it's been how many years now? Six years ago is when we started to design it. Yep. So we're relatively young, um, although you know we come from quite a deep background of similar business behind you know prior to this one. So I would say so interesting if we were to 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 zoom out and and look at this a little bit more macro. I would say that the greatest challenge has been that we became married to our business. So both of us, not just one, not, not one or, or the other, but both of us were so committed to creating success that it became evident that we were focusing almost all of our attention on the business. Mm -hmm. So then there's a lack of focus on the family, a lack of focus on the marriage, and those things begin to suffer. So those are the sharpest rocks in the shoes we found out. So, yeah, I think that was probably um, the greatest challenge for us to overcome. You know, you're the, a growing business has a lot of demands, mm. but a growing family has demands too. And, and seven, uh, seven children as well. <laughs> yeah. that's right. Yeah. And a great relationship, you know, a, a, be, loving the person that you go home to every day is a really incredible thing. And if you don't pay attention and focus or give that attention that it demands, um, it, you, you won't be excited to go home. And what's the point of all of this? You build a business to create success so that you can share more of your life with those people that you love. And I think that kind of gets lost when you're building a business and it's a natural thing that occurs for entrepreneurs. Yes. So you've obviously gone through it and you've, you're still happily married and you still got your, so how did you manage to make sure there was that balance or is it a balance? What was the, what was the key to getting through that? twofold for me. So uh, first of all, we put it on the IDS. Yeah. And that yeah. was just something that needed to get solved. So both of us went through a period of time kind of separately, but yet still um, a little bit of a crossover there where we, we experienced the same um, conviction or, or, or awareness that we're, we're just married to the business. And that's all we do is sleep, you know, eat, and, and, you know, even in the middle of the night, you're waking up thinking about strategy at, at work, right? Yeah. So um, we put on the IDS and we got really clear that this pebble in our shoe needs to come out. So we started to build some processes and hire people to take some of that weight off of ourselves. So that was kind of standard business practice to, you know, give yourself uh, more freedom or at least um, an eight hour workday instead of a 12 hour workday. 
But what was really interesting is I took all of these um, lessons. This surprised the heck out of my wife, by the way. I used to be that, that guy who was just kind of winging it. Um, and I was successful in everything that I did without really much of a plan. So it just throw me in there and I'm going to come out as the winner. That's just kind of how I lived my life. So my closet looked like that and, and my garage looked like that and everything kind of looked like that at, at home. Right. Yep. So then, but that's not how it looked at work. It was very organized at work. So I brought this EOS or traction idea home oh. and we call it traction for life at, at, at the Martin house. We call it traction for life. And my wife couldn't believe it. It's like, wait a second here. We're having um, weekly meetings. You and me. Like, yeah. And, and you're organizing your team. We have issues. I get to put things on the IDS. It's like, yeah, you do. And that closet <laughs> was one of them, by the way. Oh. Um, but now we have quarterly marriage retreats and we get together once a quarter offsite two days. And Andrea and I connect in a way that it's different than a business mm -hmm. because although we have a common goal, if you look at the business of our life, we have a common goal of our marriage. She also has her own personal goals. You know, she's getting to that spot in the life of a mother where her, she doesn't have babies anymore. So it's kind of like, mom life 2.0. So she has her own interests and her own desires. And, you know, for the first time in my, in our marriage, we understand those personal goals that the others have, and we're able to support them and challenge them and hold them accountable as well. But in a, in a, in a different way that you would at a business. Yeah. So it's, I think the outcome or the, the, um, result of, of, we've been doing that for about three years now. We always know what the year looks like in December. We set all of our, our annual trips for the year and all of our events for the year. The calendar is already booked for the whole year. So we, are, we always know what we're doing and when we're doing it, just like you would at a business. Mm -hmm. But then we also, um, when we spend those two days together, we have an agenda and, and it's, it's well thought out in, in advance. And it's, although it's different than, than a business agenda, Andrew and I have gotten to know more about each other in the last three years of doing this than we did in the first 22 years of marriage. I love so, it. yeah, we have clarity in our marriage. We have clarity in our life. We can support each other in a way that we really didn't have the capacity to do before or the awareness to do before. Yep. Um, and I think the neatest part is the, the, the way that we do these marriage retreats requires that you listen at a different level than you ever have. So I'm hearing things from her that either she hasn't had the, the platform to voice, or I've just not been listening well enough to hear, which it's probably more likely that, right? <laughs> yeah. But um, yeah, unbelievable how that's changed our marriage and how that's, in, you know, changed the way that we parent our children. Yep. It's just been amazing. So mm. Yeah, I must admit, we've started doing the EOS family plan, my husband and myself, just this year, we actually sat down and started working through it. And yeah, it is, it is, it definitely changes the way that you actually talk about things, which can be really helpful. Yeah. So you go, oh, yeah. you go away for these retreats, don't you? You actually, physically... yeah, we go off site. Well, with seven children, there's no way you could do that at home. <laughs> yeah, you know? okay. So yeah. it would get five minutes into it. And one of the little ones, would be, mom, mom. Yeah. So that wouldn't work. But yeah, so we, we make it a little retreat. We try to plan all kinds of fun things around it. And then we spend meaningful time working on our marriage, which is really neat. Mm, I love it. Absolutely love it. Thank you for sharing. Thank you for being so uh, yeah, vulnerable. Uh, so what are your your favorite um, things about business in general? Because like, you said that you, you get completely wedded to your business. What is it that really gets you excited? Well, for me, it's the relationships with the people. Mm. So I'm the lucky one. Um, Nate says he gets to have relationships with the numbers and he loves that. Um, and I wouldn't like that. So I, I really, I think the best part of the business is the relationships. Mm -hmm. So right now we have about 120 investors that invest in our, or have invested in our, in the properties. They, essentially they own the properties we manage and run them. Um, so maintaining those relationships and building those relationships is without question, the funnest part of the business for me. Mm -hmm. And how did you get clear on that being the stuff that you loved? Has it always been clear to you? I think it was just a natural thing that I became attracted to. 
So in any role or any um, business venture that I was in, I always wanted to be the one talking to the people. So I don't know. I don't, yeah, it wasn't something that was uh, an awareness. It kind of crept up on me and it just became the thing that it did. Hmm. So I love talking to people. I mean, if you had hours and hours, we would talk about all kinds of stuff oh, right here. We, yeah, we definitely would. I know we would. <laughs> so it is interesting, though, because, you know, you said that you were doing these long, long days. And part of that was you had to then go, how do we how do we resolve this? How do we um, change what we're doing? And you said that you brought process and people in. How did you decide what to give to other people? Like, how do you go, well, I've got all this stuff on my plate, but this is what I should be doing? Yeah, so we look at it in a, in, from the perspective, like, what's my superpower? Mm-hmm. And I should be doing 80% of my time to be spent doing that, right? So what ends up happening is, even though, you know, it's not my natural skill to build processes and build systems and manage spreadsheets and software and databases and those kind of things, because that was part of my side of the business, I was stuck doing it anyway. Yep. Somebody yep. had to do it. And because I had an awareness and understanding of what needed to be done, it was natural that I would do it. So it's, it was pretty simple to say, you know, what can be replaced? You know, so obviously me on the phone presenting what we're doing to somebody is more difficult to, to replace than somebody who manages um, administrative tasks. So, yeah, we started, started with an administrative person and then we um, partnered with another group that does about uh, 80% of our fund administration um, bookkeepers, like all those kind of people that do tasks for us that are just, it's a, it's just a process that needs to be built, yep. assigned to somebody and, and they need to be held accountable. So yeah. I'll delegate and elevate thing can be so, um, that's right. Freeing, can't it? Yeah. And no, I just think, you know, I think I've, I've done it recently again myself. And I mean, I do it on a regular basis, especially when I'm starting to feel like I am getting overwhelmed again. I'll look at it and go, well, what is that I really love and I'm really great at? Um, and the other stuff, what can I yeah, offload onto somebody else? Well, it's difficult too when you're in the middle of it and you understand it. You're like, mm-hmm. ah, it'd take me more time to teach somebody else how to do this than just do it myself. Well, then you start piling up a dozen of those things and now you're not you're not really living in your superpower. Yeah. You're not doing that thing that you're so good at. So the truth is that when you take time to teach somebody else what you do, usually when they take that process, they kind of look at it and say, well, that's it's okay, but I can make that 10 times better. Mm-hmm. And they do. Yeah. So yeah, that's, that also has a lot to do with right person, right seat. So yeah. you know, get the person who loves that kind of stuff and they'll, they'll refine processes yeah. for sure. Yeah. I always, when I'm working with my clients, I, I use the example of <laughs> house cleaning. So I have had a house cleaner for since I don't know when, and I don't think I'd ever not have one. Now I am amazing at cleaning because I'm half German. So I really, really clean things well, but I hate it. I, you know, there's nothing worse for me than actually doing house cleaning, but I'm so anal about it because I'm half German. It has to be done really well. And I, you know, it, it, when I'm doing it, I'm in that state of, I'm grumpy, I'm miserable, I'm, you know, you know, don't want to be around me when I'm trying to clean the house. And so it just made sense to get a house cleaner in that will do it. And of course, they actually quite enjoy it. They love it. They they get paid a lot less than I would do for doing the same task. And it just gives me the opportunity to, to even if I don't necessarily turn that free time into work time, I've got free time. I can be doing things that I really enjoy. And you haven't got that negative energy of the stuff that you really hate. So yeah, even at a simple level, a house cleaner, um, you know, it's just getting out of that negative stuff that you, it doesn't work for you. Yeah, agree. Yeah. Totally yeah. agree. So yeah. the, the, how every business and every every role that you play has some house cleaning in it, for yeah. sure. Yeah, absolutely. So tell me, so we're six years in and you've got your 10-year goal. How are you going against it? We're doing well. So yeah. typically the, the early years uh, is where you build everything. And then the latter years is where you, you built a scale. So we just got to that point in our business, probably at the, at the halfway mark mm-hmm. where we've, we've designed our business uh, for scale and now we're scaling. Yeah. So the properties are five times bigger than they were when we started. Um, the, the staff's getting bigger. It's uh, yes. Yeah, so it's, it's a, uh, I don't know if we're right on track, but it, we're, we're definitely on track. Yeah. Yeah. How do you keep, because you've got obviously a number of different um, call them communities or parks in different areas. How do you keep those different communities, different parks connected to what you're doing as a company? So a regional asset or a regional property manager um, does L- L10s with them on a regular basis, but we also get them all together. Uh-huh. So on a regular basis where all of the park staff gets together, it's a little bit more of a 
uh, show and tell or share and tell. Um, yeah. And we do a lot of training. So that when we have something that needs to be rolled out in person, mm -hmm. if we can do that, we get them all together. Now that's going to change when we have parks in different states. Mm -hmm. Right now, everything's in Arizona, but we're uh, soon we're going to go to Texas as well. Yeah. So that'll yeah. probably change. But um, yeah, there's a there's a very um, kind of uh, connected culture where they all lean on each other. So, hey, I'm trying to implement this and I, or I have a, a tenant that's behaving like this. Oh yeah, Sharon had a tenant that behaved like that too. Call Sharon, she'll walk you through it. So there's a, there's a, a real team environment, even though they may not see each other every day, mm -hmm. um, they're pretty well connected. So yeah. yeah. Love it. Okay, well, as you said, we could probably talk for hours, but we don't have hours, sadly, because people are probably listening to this while they're driving to work. Um, I'd love for you to just finish up by sharing three top tips or tools or or things that you got, you know, maybe somebody said, maybe something that you might have wanted to have known before you started your business or something you've been using that really helps you in the business. Yeah, so I, we probably touched on them already. So yeah. I would say, number one, um, if you're starting a business, don't start without reading Gina Wickman's book, Traction. Yep. Absolutely read that book. Um, if you already have an existing business and you're, you're running up against that organized chaos, um, find an EOS implementer that's suitable for you and it's in your, in your area. You, yep. you'll, the ROI that you'll get from having that person come help you implement, um, you, it's, you just can't measure it. So I would, I would say that's probably tip number one. Um, tip number two, <clears throat> stay in your superpower. So you should, you know, be honest with yourself. What are you really, really good at? And you should be doing that most of the time. And if you're not, then do, get rid of the house cleaning, like you said. Yeah. And, and outsource that. Hire somebody to take over some of that stuff that's not your superpower. And then I think the greatest lesson that, that I've learned in my lifetime is learning how to let go yeah, and believe that there's a greater power at work and that you don't need to be gripping the wheel so, so tight all the time. Yeah. Let go and sit in the back seat and, and, uh, and trust that, that you're going to be guided and, and, and things that you need are going to show up in your life. Yeah. And that, that comes when you've got that clarity of where you're headed to, too, doesn't it? So once you've got the clarity of the vision, I think these things, they just appear. They do. Yeah, they do. Yeah. Perfect. Yep. Hey, look, I've, I've really enjoyed um, meeting you and, and chatting to you about the business. I'm really excited about what you've managed to achieve and where you're headed. And um, if anybody would like to have a chat to you, maybe because they're in a similar position or they want to um, understand more about what you do, how would they get hold of you, Jack? Yeah, best way is on, on the website. So on the contact page of my website, you can actually schedule a 20 minute discovery call with me. Oh, nice. So yeah, website 5210.com. And that's the number five, the number two. And then 10 is spelled out T E N.com. Yep. Yeah. Lovely. And if anybody talk. wants to learn about mobile home park investing as a passive investor, um, that, that's the way they can connect, connect with me to learn that as well. Oh, that's fantastic. Hey, look, I really appreciate you giving us your time and your wisdom. Thank you so, so much. And I look forward to following the journey and seeing where you get to. Um, and look forward to hopefully coming to meet you one day soon. I keep, I keep meeting all these amazing American people, but we can't leave our country yet. So Maybe, maybe shortly we'll be able to come and visit. <laughs> well, thank you for inviting me, Deborah. It's been a pleasure. Yeah, thank you so much, Jack. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.